Welcome back to the podcast of the History Teachers Association of New South Wales. This episode has actually been a long time in the making and it was recorded several months ago in a narrow window that my guest Dr Peter Whitewood and I managed to find in between busy schedules and international time differences. The interview centres on a discussion of Peter's book The Red Army and the Great Terror which was published in 2015 by the University Press of Kansas. The book is essentially a detailed study of how the Red Army became a target of Stalin's terror in the late 1930s, but it also reveals important insights into the nature of Stalin's terror and the broader Stalinist system. According to Whitewood, Stalin's attack on the Red Army was not the expression of some carefully thought out plan, but actually the result of panic and confusion. It certainly had devastating results. Here we talk about the long tradition of state violence in Russia and the USSR, and many of the specific details about Stalin's purge of the military before the Second World War. Remember that you can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes and SoundCloud, but without further interruption, here is the interview with Dr. Peter Whitewood. Hi, Peter. Great to have you with us. It's great to be on. Thanks for having me. I wanted to start with a a big picture question, if that's okay, and draw on the work of James Harris, who... Uh, produced a great book a few years ago called The Great Fear. And in that, he argues that fear and terror are these kind of fairly constant aspects of, of Russian government stretching, you know, even back before the Romanov times. I wonder if you could just paint a sort of picture of, of what kinds of terror we see in Russia prior to the Bolsheviks taking power in 1917. Yeah, um, you're exactly right. Um about James's argument, uh, his book *The Great Fear* is is a, is a really great um, example of of new work on the Great Terror, and and we'll talk a bit more about that, I guess, later. And I have a lot of sympathy and agree with much of James's argument, um, not only because he was my PhD supervisor, um, but James tries to put uh, the the night the terror of the nineteen thirties in the in the longer term context to so to show its longer roots. And you're exactly right that you can look back to the um, imperial Russian autocracies, um, the Tsar um, and the different Tsars are going back several centuries. And you can see fear, terror, insecurity were a common fact of life. Um, so some examples would be maybe the um, near constant conspiracies which surrounded the various different Tsars and autocracies from Ivan the Terrible in the 16th century going through to uh, Catherine the Great in the 18th century, and so this was a constant balancing act for a czar. So they would need to uh, make sure they keep the, the nobility on side, effectively, because the nobles could band together, they could plot, they could you know carry out a conspiracy and have a czar removed. But this process of, of kind of reaction and counter reaction would then involve quite a lot of violence, arrests, and executions. So there was this um, instability at the top of the autocracy. And that itself was something which led to fear, terror, and violence. And beyond this, you've got um, violence elsewhere. Um, So beyond the elite, the nobility, and the Tsar, um, Imperial Russia was a peasant country. So the majority of the population were peasants. And it's another thing which James points to in his introduction to his book, is that um, we can look at the peasant rebellions, um, most, most, most notably the Pugachev Rebellion, which took place under Catherine the Great, an extensive rebellion in the south of Russia, tens of thousands of people, and Emilian Pugachev claimed to be Catherine the Great's dead and deposed husband, Peter III, and this was quite common um, practice anyway. But this was a serious challenge to the autocracy, and it's coming from the people. And again, this is something which happens with significant amounts of violence and unrest. And of course, the Russian army are the people who put this down. So it's another example where you can see insecurity and and violence as a result. And finally, James points to other kind of factors which um, are kind of intrinsic to uh, the Russian Empire. It was a very large country, it's an expansive landmass with a large, porous border. It's very difficult to defend that border. Um, And so there is an insecurity about you know, who is making their way into the country. Um, At the same time, as the empire successfully expands, as it does in particular under Peter the Great and then Catherine the Great, um, the empire becomes even larger and more peoples are brought into it, and particularly uh, non-Russian peoples. 
And so in the end, by, by the time you get to the early 20th century, late 19th century, Russians are actually the largest minority, according to census data. And this, again, it's another point of insecurity. Um, to what extent can the peoples of Russia be reliable as far as the Tsar and the autocracy see things? And this is where you get processes like Russification, uh, which were well highly repressive against um, non-Russian cultures and peoples and really limited their freedom of action. Um, and this is an, another point of insecurity that is that is kind of fueling what is a, a regime, sorry, which is which is quite um, you know oppressive anyway. And finally, in in terms of a, a final um, kind of point of, of violence and terror, uh, which is a bit more specific, um, relates to revolutionary activity that occurs, you know, starts to build in the nineteenth century. There are various revolutionary groups, the forerunners to the Bolsheviks, and uh, some of them, like the People's Will, are carrying out campaigns of violence and terror are aimed specifically at the, um, the Tsar, and they managed to successfully um, assassinate um, Alexander II in 1881, and that's the People's Will, they blow up his carriage. And of course, this leads to another counter-reaction of violence and arrests and so on. So the kind of, I guess the big point is that the violence and terror and insecurity did not suddenly emerge after 1917. They're not something that's unique to the Soviet period. And of course, there are differences, and we can talk about those differences, but um, there are also longer term similarities, which really go back centuries um, into the Russian Empire. And so I think that, in, you know, coming back to, I guess, James's book on the Great Fear, I think this is this is kind of an effective way to put that um, the events of the 1930s under Stalin in their context. When the Bolsheviks take power, they are also quick to establish organs of terror. And these come to play quite an important role in the Soviet system under both Lenin and Stalin. So just so we've got something to compare uh, Stalin's use of terror with, can you talk us through how and why the Bolshevik regime under Lenin used state violence? Yeah, of course. Um, well, under Lenin, the 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 it's the organization um, which carried out most of the violence and terror in the Soviet Union is created, which is the Cheka, um, the forerunner to the GPU, OGPU, NKVD, you know, eventually the KGB <clears throat> in the Cold War. And um, this is created early on um, after the revolution, and the Cheka is is initially um, focused on on, on combating counter revolution. And sabotage, as as they and Lenin and the Bolshevik regime see it, but in terms of the um, kind of bigger um, eruption of violence which occurs during those years, it, it's it's the so-called Red Terror of uh, 1918, summer to autumn 1918, which begins in August of that year. And we have to remember that this, the context of this anyway, is the Russian Civil War, which is an extremely violent and brutal time. Um, more Russians are killed. In the Russian Civil War than in the Russian war effort in the First World War. So it's an extremely um, brutal couple of years until 1921. But the Red Terror is, I suppose, characteristic of um, Lenin's use of state violence. So the, the, the common starting point and, and, and flashpoint for this is an attempted assassination attempt by someone com called Fanya Kaplan against Lenin in August 1918, and then we have this, um, again, this counter-reaction against um, enemies as, as the Bolsheviks see them to the revolution sparked by this assassination attempt. And may maybe up to 10,000 people, it's a kind of a lower estimate, are killed during the next few months and in a series of executions and arrests. And there have been various different explanations for this. And, I, and the Red Terror, I think, still remains something which divides opinion. Um, I mean, some historians have seen this as really um, Lenin's kind of true uh, views put into action. You know, he was someone who was ideological. He wanted to transform Russia and wanted to do this at speed. And that was a process which therefore involved violence. Um, in order to enact the type of transformation Lenin wanted, he needed to use extreme measures. So there is an ideological explanation. Um, others, by contrast, have have kind of focused less on the ideology and thought: Is this something you know? The Red Terror is this more? Um, does it does it emerge more from the conditions of Russia itself, from the Russian Revolution, which itself was a, a quite chaotic and and not always peaceful process, of course? And is the Red Terror an extension of that? So there is a different kind of side to this too. 
Um, whereas there are, I guess, more more recent explanations, perhaps would, would uh, and I'm thinking of James Ryan's book um, called Lenin's Terror, where he where he um, notes or makes the case that Lenin never um, wanted to eliminate entire um, population groups such as the bourgeoisie. So he wasn't operating in this ideological kind of transformative mode, but he was certainly um, focused on removing any enemies to the revolution. And so there is there is a kind of this is a more kind of I guess. Um, measured way of looking at things so it really comes down to ideology versus circumstances and i think this is this is often at the heart of lots of debates about soviet political violence to what extent are they driven by ideological principles whether you say that's leninism whether you say that's marxism or communism are these ideologies which are disposed predisposed to violence or is it about the wider circumstances is there something to, about Russia? Is there something about the Russian Revolution, for instance? Um, is it due to the fact it's the civil war? The civil war is extremely violent. The whites, the, the main opponents in the civil war, the white armies also um, exercised um, extreme barbarity um, and anti-Semitic pogroms. Um, their use of violence wasn't as systematic as the Bolsheviks, for sure. But it, it's not the case that this is just... Um, the Bolshevik party who are carrying out political violence. So um, maybe we can uh, again come back to this, but I think ideology versus circumstances is something which is a good way of looking at this. But then at the same time, there there, there, there is a lot of crossover uh, between those two things. When we come up to the Stalin years, there's, I guess there's got some similarities with, you know, the, the debates around the role and, and reasons for terror under, under him, particularly in that period, you know, between about 1928 to 41, so pre-war Stalinism. And I think some historians have tended to see terror under Stalin as this kind of, you know, very essential feature of the regime and that, you know, it was kind of one of the great pillars of Stalinism, you might say. And then I think others have tended to sort of take a different view, not that they've said that terror wasn't important, but that it was kind of, you know, one aspect of a more complicated system where Stalin enjoyed, you know, his genuine support and there's a whole range of things going on there. I just wondered if you could capture the essence of that debate and sort of point out where discussions about the Stalinist terror have kind of come to in recent times. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and you're right. I mean, the debate really has kind of moved in in that direction um, early on in, in the Cold War, when you, you've got some of the first kind of histories of the Stalin era. So in the 1950s, 1960s, uh, the view of um, Stalin's use of political violence was that it was it was all top down. So terror was practiced from above, um, and and this was this was known as the totalitarian kind of view, the totalitarian argument, um, because the Soviet Union, as a totalitarian society, which exercised um, almost you know, total control over the lives of its citizens, and so in this perspective, terror, as I say, comes in one direction. Stalin kind of does this in a very purposeful way. There are people that he wants eliminated. There's opposition that more potential opposition that he wants out of the way. And those under him, so head of the NKVD, Nikolai Yezhov, for instance, will carry those orders out. And so that that was very much that perspective. But this was certainly challenged in the 70s and 80s by the um, so-called revisionist um, perspective, which, which pretty much said that if you're just looking at top-down violence, you're missing a big part of the picture, and that's the social side. You know that the, the, the people themselves, the Soviet people, were involved and participated in the Great Terror, for instance, and they did this by writing denunciations in their hundreds of thousands. So they were they, they would they would write denunciations to the political police, um, informing about the, the suspicious conduct of their neighbor or that someone at work, you know, is, is hanging around with a former Trotskyist and, and this would lead to arrests. Um, and so the, for the revisionist, the way to understand the terror was to look at that interaction. You know, it wasn't all just top down. You know, we have to consider and explore seriously why would people denounce each other um, to the political police? And so that was, I think, a major intervention. And 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 understanding that the historians today, you know, would not exclude kind of either of these sides. They would definitely involve both the top-down and so-called bottom-up sides to the terror. But you also noted that um of well, revisionist historians too, that they, they tended to see more complexity um and perhaps chaos in the Stalinist state. 
So in contrast to the totalitarian perspective, the older view from the 50s and 60s, which saw almost kind of a very well-oiled machine that would carry out terror in an efficient manner. Um, revisionist historians, I'm thinking people like Arch Getty, um, argued that there was more chaos in the system, that Stalin wasn't always the author of every initiative. It's not to say that he's not responsible for the terror, but there were other people who exercised their own initiative. Um, and Stalin didn't always get his orders carried out in the way that he wanted. And so for someone like Getty, the terror is more a, a kind of a reaction to this inability to um, make the system work. Um, and so it was more Stalin lashing out rather than him purpose of purposely carrying out a campaign of violence against his enemies. And finally, just to talk a bit about the uh, more recent times, you know, when the Soviet Union collapsed after, uh, from 1991, uh, the Russian archives opened, well, they, they significantly expanded access. Um, so, you know, historians could look at things like Stalin's personal archive, which is now online, which is, you know, an amazing thing to to um, have access to. Um, but this, in a sense, it, it, it um, legitimized and uh, proved some of the totalitarian view, but also some of the revisionist view. So, for instance, um, in the 1990s, historians discovered and learnt about the mass operations. Again, we'll talk about these, I guess, a bit later on. But the mass operations are the, the kind of the big part of the Great Terror, and that's recognised now. That's when most of the victims come. But prior to the, un the discovery of the mass operations, <clears throat> um, the terror was seen as a party terror, whereas now we know it, it's also a wave of violence against the ordinary Soviet population. But the key thing was that the mass operations have Stalin's signatures on them. You know, he signed these off. This is undoubtedly terror from above that led to hundreds and thousands of executions. So this vindicated the totalitarian view to a certain extent. But on the on other sides, um, the, um, the archives also proved the revisionists to be right. So, you know, someone like Robert Conquest, for instance, who, uh, a key name in the totalitarian view, um, argued that Stalin had Sergei Kirov killed in 1934, the Leningrad party boss, and this was the beginning of the Great Terror. There's been no evidence in the archives that's been found to prove that theory. Um, and so this does this, this mean that the terror is more of a reactive thing rather than a purposely designed process? And again, that lends itself to the revisionist view and also the, the amount of denunciation letters and the evidence of involvement from the Soviet people in this process shows that, you know, we can't just divide it between totalitarian versus revisionist. And there's been very much a synthesis of those two um, schools of thought. And that's how the Great Terror is really kind of understood um, pretty much in the last 20 years or so. Before we get into talking specific events and, and people, which we'll, we'll kind of, you know, get right into the detail of, of the terror and particularly with your work on the Red Army, I just wanted to see if you could please paint a bit of a broad picture about the, the different ways in which terror is used, a little bit like we did, I guess, earlier with the way in which we see terror in, in the pre-Soviet era. Under Stalin, how is he using terror and what, what sort of forms do we see it emerge in? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. Um... And I think it, it, it's sometimes a bit difficult because the Great Terror as a term is a convenient shorthand. And that's the one which is used for the events of 1937 and 1938. But of course, we can also see you know, acts of terror, um, which is a good word for it. I mean, it's extreme political violence, state violence. You can see that in previous um, years and in other periods. So there is the Great Terror of the nine, late 1930s which is a specific thing and a specific part of the Stalin era. But there are um, other episodes of terror. So we could look and talk about maybe collectivization, um, which, of course, was um, extremely harsh and brutal on the um, Soviet peasantry where they were uh, rounded up into collected farms. You know, their land was nationalized. Um, those who resisted uh, were sent to the, the, the emerging um, Gulag um, camp network. Um, and so this is undoubtedly an act of mass state violence. And it, it, the important thing I think about collectivization too is that it's aimed at a particular cohort. So it's aimed at kulaks. Um, they're the ones who, who really suffer during collectivization. 
um, particularly during the, the so-called dekulakization program, so the attempt to eliminate the kulaks as a class. And there are connections to the later Great Terror because those type of campaigns come up again. So I've already talked about briefly the mass operations of the Great Terror, which, um, which targeted particular cohorts. So in a similar way that kulaks were targeted in the years of collectivization, um, in 1937, you have an operation against Kulaks. Um, so it's targeting, once again, a population cohort. It's not the case that people, individuals, are being investigated and arrested on the merits of their supposed crimes. Um, it's, it's anyone who fits the category. Anyone who is in the label is being swept up. And in, ca in the case of the um, Kulak operation, Operation um, 00447, they are um, often executed without trial. Um, so this this is a this is why it's some of the most dramatic and um, damaging parts of the Great Terror. But there there are interesting connections between those two things. Um, so I think that's where you, you kind of see terror in in different in different places and kind of in between collectivization, uh, decolonization, and also the Great Terror. There are also different types of campaigns, which um, the state used its power to target other population groups. So there were campaigns against so-called socially harmful elements, for instance, which would sweep cities to um, remove any people who were deemed to be unreliable. Um, and so so this, again, is the, the same use of that, 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 cap, that, that method, which targets individual, sorry, population groups rather than individuals. And part of the um, controversy about understanding the Great Terror um, is that you have these different episodes of terror elsewhere. Um, and that comes back to whether the Great Terror as a term is is still a good shorthand or not. And I'm not sure I've got kind of a good kind of answer to that. Um, and it's also led some historians to actually draw stronger connections between decriminalization and collectivization and the mass operations of 1937 than they do um, the party terror and the show trials and all the rest from 1936. And so they see that as actually a slightly separate uh, process, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Absolutely. To kind of pick up that story there, actually, I, I'd like to zero in on that period between about 36 to 38. I know people sort of periodize this a little bit differently, but you know, if we take that classic kind of great terror moment, so to speak, where we get this huge spike in arrests and executions and deportations and so on from, from about 1936 through to 38, obviously that's one area that most historians would agree on. I mean, I don't think there's anyone really sort of doubting the fact that this was a, a huge outburst of state violence. What do we know about the causes of this or what are, what are some of the big theories about the causes of this at least? On the, on the causes, I mean, we, we, you have to think about the Kirov murder, right? So I've talked about this just briefly already, but um, Sergei Kirov uh, was a Leningrad party boss and he is killed in December 1934. And this, whichever way you look at it, is the start of a um, wave of arrests in the side, the Communist Party. Um, now, going back to actually some of the perspectives and interpretations of the Great Terror, the kind of older total totalitarian view uh, so someone like Robert Conquest, for instance, um, described the Kirov murder as the crime of the century. And that's because he argued that Stalin um, had prearranged it. So Stalin wanted Kirov out of the way because he was deemed to be a moderate. He was someone who was potentially a challenger for the leadership. That's kind of how this argument went. And so he arranges um, Kirov to be murdered. And the, the, the assassin is a, a disgruntled uh, party member, someone called Leonid Nikolaev. And so uh, for conquest, that was the beginning of the Great Terror. So once Kirov is killed, um, Stalin rushes through new emergency laws, which allow for um, expedited um, kind of uh, trials and, and without proper defense. And, and um, it, it quickens the process of arrest to execution. And this allows for a consolidation of power. But as I've said already, too, there's no evidence that um, Stalin arranged the Kirov murder. Um, there's nothing in the archives and it's not like we would find a smoking gun. You know, we wouldn't find a, a telegram from Stalin ordering this, but there are no indications. 
but it, it doesn't really change the story dramatically because you know even if Nikolaev um, killed Kirov um, independently, which is the most likely explanation, because Nikolaev was kind of down on his luck. He you know he blamed the party for his his, his poor standard of living. He'd lost his job, and he happens upon. Um, Sergei Kirov um, outside his office and he has a gun and so this is how this transpires but the reaction is the same so which you know the Kirov murder happens and Stalin um, even though he didn't prearrange it he still points the finger at the former opposition so you still get that process of arrests of former Trotskyists of uh, Zinoviev supporters who are blamed for being part of the conspiracy um, but I think the distinction does matter in the way that um, if if Stalin didn't prearrange the Kirov murder, then the Great Terror, the beginnings of it, at least in the 1930s, is reactive. It's a reaction to, it's not premeditated. And that, I think, is very important for understanding Stalin's motivations, because there are some historians, and I guess that me included, who would um, argue that the terror was more a reactive phenomenon rather than it being carefully premeditated so you know that 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 kind of debate also applies to Kirov but once Kirov is 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 killed in December 1934 and you've got this rolling series of arrests of former oppositionists people used to belong to the Trotskyist opposition in the 1920s but as was often the case they were allowed back in the party in the late 20s and early 30s if they repented their crimes and their former views, um, and, and and they are being arrested at an increasing rate. So that is the terror inside the party. This leads to eventually the show trials of 1936, because Stalin has pointed the finger at the opposition from 1934. Um, and it, this means eventually Zinoviev, you know, Kamenev, and, and the four leaders of the former opposition are implicated and they are accused of planning um, additional terrorist attacks against uh, party leaders, including including Stalin. Of course, this is where we start to get the show trials. So that's the party terror. But separate to this, it's kind of separate and related are the mass operations because they start in summer 1937. I've talked already about the Kulak operation, which is the first mass operation. There are subsequent national oper- national um, operations which are targeted not against Kulaks, but against um, non-Russian cohorts in the Soviet Union, such as Poles. That's the largest um, national operation. But there's a German operation, a Korean operation, and so on. They're violence of a different type because it's not charging people um, and former oppositionists of being involved in conspiracies against Stalin and, and the regime. And, um, you know, it, it doesn't stem from that um, Kirov murder. Um, the, the Kulak operation, the national operations, seem to be something different. Um, and and it, it, it's historians, uh, this is one, I guess, one of the big controversies about the Great Terror is how do they relate? How do you get from a terror in the party, which, relatively speaking, is much smaller than the mass operations? Um, how do you kind of how do you link the two? Um, and I've said already too. This is this. Some historians like Paul Hagenlold, David Shearer, um, are two that spring to mind. Have drawn stronger connections to collectivization and the mass operations. So one argument, for instance, goes that um, the foreign threat is the big thing, which is driving the mass operations. So the terror begins, the party terror, you have the beginning of the show trials, and then this rolling wave of violence, Stalin is starting to fear that foreign agents are in the country, that the, you know, the, the Soviet Union is at risk of being infiltrated, and that there are enemies everywhere as far as he sees it. And so he, in the summer of 1937, turns against the population to wipe out anyone who is unreliable, and that involves Kulak's um, and non-Russian groups. So this is where you get the, these specific arguments for the Great Terror, which are um, well focused on things like the, the perceived foreign threat in the interwar period, which is something we're all familiar with uh, from those years in the run-up to the Second World War. But still, I mean, from my point of view, that doesn't adequately explain why the mass operations happen when they do. Uh, why do they happen specifically 
in the summer of 1937. And we'll talk a bit more, I guess, about the military purge and the Red Army. Um, but, but my view is that the military purge is the bridge between these two things. So the party terror and the show trials um, is connected to the mass operations by the military purge, because that is something which extends the violence firmly outside of the realms of the party. And much of the driver of the um, military purge is the perceived foreign threat. So it connects these two things. And of course, the military purge happens right in the middle, which is um, it begins May, June. 1937. So much of this is still, you know, it's still controversial. And I think that we will never actually get firm answers to it because, you know, to, to really understand the connections between the different parts of the terror, um, we'd need access to more archival material, particularly in the FSB archives where you, know, you could look at more uh, material from the NKBD, the political police. And I think that's where actually there may be um, clearer answers. So the terror is, it's quite expansive, isn't it? I mean, we're talking about kulaks. We've got undesirables in sort of everyday society. We've got the party. We've got um, national minorities being drawn into this. And obviously it, your expertise is right around the Red Army. So this is, this is a, a, a violence that potentially touches almost sort of anybody in society. And your book focuses right in on the Red Army within that period. And it is one of the questions that people often ask is, why does he reach out and lash out at the Red Army at this particular point? What do we know about that? Um, I mean, it's a very good question. It's one which I, I, I think um, attracted me to the subject in the first place, is why, why purchase the army when war is coming? It seems so self-defeating, uh, particularly because the scale of the military purge is, is substantial. It is, it is damaging. Um, I think that well, my, my, one of my key arguments, I think, which I, I put in the book, um, about the military purge is that by 1937, Stalin comes to believe that the Red Army is compromised at all levels. This is very much the evidence which is um, being being sent to him from uh, the head of the uh, political police, Yezhov, and also Clement Voroshilov, who's the head of the Red Army, who's, who's more kind of a, a, a defender of the Red Army, really, but, but even he starts to see the writing on the wall. Um, in truth, the Red Army isn't compromised by um, enemies at all levels. You know, it hasn't been infiltrated by spies and foreign agents. But such is the nature of this spy scare during the Great Terror and this fear of, of enemies. And, and this is just this extremely chaotic and disorienting time. Um, and, and I can talk more about the backstory of how they end up in this place where they start to believe that the Red Army has been um, compromised in such a way in a second. But I think that this is where the distinction comes to other accounts of the military purge and the Red Army, which often focus on um, Tukhachevsky, Mikhail Tukhachevsky, who was the um, one of the, the most renowned commanders in the Red Army. He, he becomes deputy of the Red Army by 1937 on his um, arrest and execution. Um, and this is this is you know, his, his death in particular is the one that caused the causes kind of worldwide scandal. Um but it, it's not an isolated thing. Often the military purge is written about as the so-called Tukhachevsky affair, um, which makes it seem like there is a small group of enemies as Stalin sees them. So he accuses Tukhachevsky of being a German agent working for the Japanese, part of the, the plots that have been circulating since 1934. And a small group of his his, his colleagues and um, other commanders are, are um, also accused of being uh, members of a military fascist plot, um, as it's called. And this, and then using that, it's said that Stalin then purges the Red Army. But I don't think this makes, you know, that much sense really. In the, for the reasons you've talked about, is that why do it when war is coming? It's a big risk. It's a gamble. And what I show in the book, my book on the Red Army, is that actually it's not just a small group. It's not just a military fascist plot of the Tukhachevsky group. By May 1937, Voroshilov writes a report to Stalin which says that the army is compromised at all levels, like literally top to bottom, and they need to do something serious about it. So Tukhachevsky and you know the, the commanders in the high command, the, the senior people who are arrested with him, are an important part of this. But there is a much bigger picture, and there is a much uh, larger perceived danger which goes beyond that small group of commanders. 
And it's that, I argue, that, that, that forces Stalin to take the risk. Because how can he go to into war with an army that is so badly compromised? And so what option does he have? But then the key question becomes, why does he believe this? Why, by 1937... Not only him, but Yezhov, um, event, you know, even Voroshilov, perhaps, and even though he he naturally defended the military, but there are other people too who accept that the Red Army is compromised in such a way when it actually wasn't, and that's kind of a, a, the other side of of the book, which tells that story um, from from the uh, formation of the Red Army in 1918. And so, can you maybe just provide a bit of a brief insight, uh, some brief insights into that? I mean. Because it is it is such a big unanswered question as we're talking about it, and I'm listening to you speak here. This notion that okay, well, if if we know that the army is not compromised, but they they come to believe that it is, I mean, are they just gamb- like completely gambling in the sense that you know it's better to purge them in case they are, or are they are they actually convinced at this point, and and what might be going on in their head if they are convinced? Um, I mean, it's certainly a gamble and a risk, and I think that I. My view on Stalin's decision in 1937 is that um, it's impossible to say whether he was completely certain that he was taking the right course of action. But um, I think that the position which he found himself in, or you know, the, the 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 dangers which he saw around him, meant that he did. He was encouraged and incentivized to take that risk, even as damaging as it was. But to understand why that would be seen as credible, why was there? Um, deemed to be a credible threat in the Red Army of this scale by 1937, you have to look at the longer history of the Red Army. Um, So going all the way back to 1918, in its formation, um, because the Bolsheviks never wanted a standing army. They didn't want um, to to create the Red Army, really, because standing armies were seen to be um, belonging to capitalist states. And so they were doing things differently, right? They were Bolsheviks that were creating a revolutionary society, and so they wanted a people's militia. They saw this as much more fitting their new socialist state. But of course, they're in a civil war um, and the revolution is under threat. And so Lenin realizes they have to have a standing army. Uh, Trotsky, of course, um, begins to push for this as well. He, he becomes war commissar in its first iteration. And um, the Red Army is therefore created and is instrumental in winning the civil war. But Right from the beginning, there are there are doubts about the Red Army. So um, it, it because the Bolsheviks don't have much military expertise. You know, they're revolutionaries; they're not military commanders. They have to use um, volunteers from the old Imperial Army. Sometimes they have to coerce um, commanders from the old Imperial Army into the ranks of the Red Army. And some of these people did betray uh, the Bolsheviks. They would switch sides, but it, it, it creates a a, a um, a doubt about the its reliability. So you've got this core of um, old imperial commanders and officers. Can they be trusted? Now, in many cases, they could be. As I say, there were some cases of betrayals and so on. But for the most part, um, the, you know, the, the uh, imperial officers actually um, kind of played their part. Um, certainly during the Civil War, because they were um, at least... Um, even if they didn't agree with the Bolshevik cause, they wanted to protect the integrity of Russia from um, future invasions and so on, maybe from a resurgent Germany, for instance. Um, And so the Bolsheviks had a tendency to exaggerate the dangers in the Red Army from the beginning. So we have old imperial officers, and during the Civil War, maybe at least a third of officers in the Red Army were from the old imperial army. Um, And then going into the 1920s, the problems continued to mount up. So... Um, the revolution, well, in 1917, yeah, the, the, the dream was, the vision was that the revolution would spread around the world, that it would create world communism. But of course, that doesn't happen. So the Soviet Union finds itself isolated um, in the world and it, it's, it's on its own, aside from, of course, a partnership uh, with Germany, another prior state in Europe. And this um, really starts to consolidate a, 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 an idea called capitalist encirclement. Um, which is something which takes hold in the upper Bolshevik party leadership, that they start to see their state as surrounded by hostile capitalist powers. You know, an invasion is coming. The final clash between communism and capitalism is inevitable. This is something which Stalin certainly kind of held quite dear as an idea. Um, 
but this has implications for the Red Army because if the capitalist powers are um, ready wait, and preparing their invasion and they're, they're trying to undermine the Soviet state, of course they're going to target the Red Army. This is the fear. And so alongside uh, the imperial officers, which are deemed to be suspicious, and they're still in the Red Army into the 1920s, even though they are replaced at an increasing rate. There are concerns about the infiltration of the army by foreign agents and spies, and this is something which which the political police kind of um, discover supposedly um, uh, in the 1920s itself. And then you've got the Red Army kind of intersecting with the um, the party struggle in the 1920s. So there is a small Trotskyist um, support in the, in, in, the, in the Red Army. Um, so there are some military Trotskyists. They're not very large. They're not particularly significant, but they support Trotsky in his um, struggle with Stalin after Lenin's death. So it's another kind of point of potential unreliability. Even during collectivization, and we talked about collectivization already, where peasants are... Um, targeted and uh, land nationalized and many um, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands are sent to uh, Gulag camps. Um, the Red Army comes, um, there's big fears about the reliability of the Red Army during collectivization because many soldiers were peasants and many knew what was happening to their families. So this is kind of the story time and time again, you know, can the regime fully rely on its army? And what really kind of, um, I think telescopes these these fears and makes them much more significant in the Great Terror, is that when Kirov is killed, and we we talked about Kirov and this this expansion of a terror in the party and former oppositionists are arrested in 1935 and 36, it it brings things back to the army because some of the military Trotskyists from the 20s are also arrested during that process, so the Red Army is pulled into the Great Terror quite early on. Um, some of these military Trotskyists are associated directly with some of the people and party members who are on the first Moscow show trial in 1936. And so um, this catches the interest of people like uh, Yezhov, head of the NKVD, who starts to talk about in 1936 that they need to look at the army more closely. There might be more enemies, there might be more um, agents of Trotsky. And another kind of key thing about the Great Terror, which we've not mentioned so much, is that the narrative of it starts to change in 1936 to 37. So from being um, a, a phenomenon and a series of arrests targeted at former oppositionists, in 1937 it becomes much more about foreign agents and ca uh, capitalist states, fascist states, and that it's not just... Um, Trotskyists and former oppositionists who are domestic terrorists, they are now working in cahoots with the fascists and the, the, the Germans and the Japanese. And this is where the, 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 the terror in, in the army starts to widen, because it's not just former oppositionists who are being targeted. You know, it, it's quite clear if you're a former oppositionist or not, but anyone could potentially be a German agent or a Japanese agent. Um, and... So this is where we get this um, spy scare start to build in 1937. And as I say, by May, Voroshilov is writing to Stalin to say that the army is compromised at all levels. Why does Stalin believe this? Well, there's the, the first-hand immediate evidence which he's seeing of the Great Terror and the interrogations and the arrests and all, the, and all of that. And so there is an immediate sense of credibility to, the, to this. But I think what gives it that additional credibility is the longer history of the Red Army. All the way back to the 1918s, so for 20 years, there have been doubts about the reliability of the Red Army. And so these two things come together. I don't, without that longer history, maybe Stalin wouldn't have acted the way he did and launched the military purge in 1937. Um, and certainly without the Great Terror, that wouldn't have happened at all. You know, you, you need the two things to come together to create that explosion of violence. And so I think in that way that the, the, the the terror in the Red Army is quite specific. It's got its own specific story. And I've said already that I think it's a key moment in the Great Terror as well, because then it, it links the party terror to the um, mass operations, which begin two, three months after Tukhachevsky is um, arrested and executed. In his book, um, Propaganda State in Crisis, David Brandenberger makes a big deal out of this arrest of, of Tukhachevsky. I mean, a lot of people do, but just it's a book that comes to mind about 
um, looking at, at the arrest in a, in a, from a slightly different sort of perspective because the book is about propaganda and public reactions and so on. And so I wanted to sort of use that as a, as a launch pad to talk about um, the arrest of Tukhachevsky and, and its impacts on, on the way people perceive all of this. Can we start by just talking about why he's arrested and targeted in the first place? I mean, you mentioned a couple of reasons before, but it would just be useful, I think, in understanding why he becomes this real figurehead um, at the beginning of the, the, the army's um, uh, terror. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, Tukhachevsky is the uh, is the big name who is who's arrested in the in the military, and as I say, that that's something which um, creates kind of worldwide consternation. You know, when when this is announced to the to the press. Um, I mean, Tukhachevsky has a specific story in the sense that he is someone who he gets on with Stalin, and Stalin. I think the important thing is that Stalin constantly promotes Tukhachevsky. All right, so if, if if Stalin wanted to get rid of Tukhachevsky earlier on, he could have done it. He had plenty of opportunity, um, but he continually promotes him. But he's also someone who um, uh, has lots of arguments and disputes with other people in the Soviet military. Um, so uh, Simeon Budyonny, for instance, who was kind of wedded to keeping the cavalry as a, a key part of the Red Army, but Tukhachevsky didn't see the cavalry as, as, as part of a modern um, a modern Red Army and, and the type of force which he believed was needed. Um, Tukhachevsky does not get on either with Clement Voroshilov, who is the head of the army. But Voroshilov and Budyani are very much Stalin, are close to Stalin. They're his associates in a way that Tukhachevsky isn't. So I think that Stalin recognizes Tukhachevsky's abilities. You know, he's a famed commander. He's relatively young. He's someone who um, knows much more about modern methods of war than his, you know, Budyani and Voroshilov. But there is this kind of political dynamic to it. Tukhachevsky is also um, notable because um, he, outside the Soviet Union, the, the, the white movement, for instance, um, the exiled whites who fought against the Bolsheviks in the Civil War, they are across Europe um, throughout the 1920s and 30s in places like France, for instance, and they hold great hope that a kind of Napoleon figure might emerge from the Red Army and overthrow the Bolsheviks. And they put a lot of hope in Tukhachevsky because they see he's got this reputation as being someone who's more independent minded. Even though in reality he's a committed Bolshevik, even though of course he's not quite as close to Stalin as as other people in the army, as I've said, but the whites really hold on to him as being someone who might who might actually do this and carry out a coup d'état. So there's a long history of rumours about Tukhachevsky which filter into the Soviet Union because the NKVD learn about this, they write it down, they put it in their reports. And this, I think, is part of what gives some of the, the, the plot and the military fascist plot of 1937 additional credibility. There are rumours about Tukhachevsky's supposed disloyalty filtering into the Soviet Union still in 1937. And in fact, in the 20s, um, the OGPU, so when the political police were, were known as the OGPU, um, they carried out a, a operation against the whites called Operation Trust, which um, created uh, fictional white organisations uh, and you know, kind of sets them up as being um, counter-revolutionary. Uh, but they are, they are just used to gain information about authentic and real white groups. So it's to try and attract people into these fake organizations. And they spread rumors that Tukhachevsky is unreliable. You know, they, they are actually fueling these very same rumors, which you see in the exiled white uh, movement themselves. So Tukhachevsky is an object of, of many attentions. And the rumors about him certainly don't help in 1937. But at the same time, um, the, the NKVD understand that these are just rumors because they propagated them themselves. So there are other reasons, you know, it, it, that's not the, the key reason why Tukhachevsky is brought down. It's not just to do with rumors. You know, as I say, we have to think about this broader history of unreliability, what perceived unreliability in the Red Army itself. There's also the, um, the uh, kind of political disagreements between people in the high command, between Voroshilov, Tukhachevsky, Budyonny, and Stalin, you know, he seems to be actually quite not loyal to Tukhachevsky, but he keeps promoting him. He even apologizes to him in the early 30s when he, there's a moment where he's kind of very critical of Tukhachevsky's ideas. But then he actually sends him a rare apology a couple of years later. So I think it's something which Stalin does reluctantly in the end. But it does have 
major impact, as you say. David Brandenburg is a very good book, um, uh, Propaganda State in Crisis, talks in part about the impact of the um, Tukhachevsky uh, arrest and execution, because this is extremely disorientating for the Soviet people. You know, you know, one moment Tukhachevsky is being portrayed in the press as a hero of the Soviet Union. The next minute, he's a counter-revolutionary. And this provoked various different responses. So there are, of course, some in Soviet society, and this goes back to those revisionist approaches, which I've talked about already, um, who, who believed the propaganda. They believed the stories of enemies um you know, in, in, in Soviet society that needed to be rooted out. And so they would they would accept this. Others, it, it caused this kind of profound distrust in the regime. You know, how what were they how you know what could they possibly think? You know, how could they understand this that Tukhachevsky was being arrested, someone who was a hero of the Soviet Union. So I think you know, Brandenburg really kind of stresses how this adds to this sense of disorientation in nineteen thirty seven. And I think that's exactly the right way to think about it. And again it underlines to me that that's very, very characteristic of the Great Terror. It wasn't this carefully ordered process of arrests and executions from the top. It was a chaotic process. And of course, it's eventually reined in in 1938 when Stalin finally realizes it's, it's gone too far. It's a, it's a great book, that Brandon Berger book, in the way he, he deals with that public side of yeah, the reaction, because it, it is a, it's a whirlwind sort of event, isn't it? I mean, Tukhachevsky is arrested, he's executed soon after. And this is all happening, not actually that long after he's been promoted to, to field marshal. So it's kind of, if you believe that, that he's been arrested for good reasons, you're kind of disillusioned. But if you think the government has made this up and are, and are running some sort of conspiracy, you also get disoriented from the reaction. So sort of everybody gets, um, I suppose, reacts in a similar way is, is what he sort of points out, which I thought was helpful. Yeah, exactly right. So if we kind of begin to look at the the impacts of all of this and step back, you know, for a minute and look at the impacts of all of this on the Red Army, what can we say about that? I mean, like how many victims are there of the terror in the army and, you know, what happens to them? What happens to the army in this process? Um, yeah, of course. Um, in terms of the the impact, the total impact, um, this is, uh, it's often uh, uh, pointed to as... Um, well, there's different ways of looking at it. So there are around 30,000 people affected in the military by the military purge. Um, so maybe over 30,000 uh, 30, people are removed from the ranks. So they lose their positions. Um, what, what are we talking about here in terms of size of the fort? Like 30,000 of how many? Well, the Red Army is about, I think it's about half a million by this point, maybe 400,000 um, at this point in time. And um, I'm sure that's right. Um, so it, it's not a huge amount compared to that wider number. But a lot of the um, arrests and executions are concentrated near, near the top. Um, and I think it's actually very difficult to understand some of the wider um, impact of the Great Terror in the rank and file. So there are more, there's more reliable evidence when it comes to, you know, terror in the officer corps, for instance, than it is the wider rank and file. So I think there's still a lack of clarity about the exact impact, but it, it, there are there are there are um, this kind of stronger information as you get closer to the top, and you know the military purge is notorious for um, you know I mean it's, it's things like three out of five marshals of the Soviet Union are are executed. You know this is a, a, a significant loss at the top in high command. Um, so you know the, the number that's often as I say, um, in books on this subject, is around 30,000 people removed, maybe 10,000 arrested, 7,000 executed, approximately. Um, and sometimes that, that number is, is slightly um, misrepresented because it's, it's not the case that 30,000 were executed. If you see what I mean, the executions is around 7,000. And in fact, many people are brought back into the ranks later on. So many of those are restored, but there is still a significant loss at the top um, in the high command, in the officer corps. And of course, that has an impact on expertise um, and all the rest. So it is a decapitation of the army. That's the best way to think about it. Um, but the, the, the wider impact, I think, is still unclear. You know, there will be more arrests in the rank and file than we realize. But I think that that information is quite difficult to um, kind of gather and, and, and put together. How does this 
affect international opinion of the, the Soviet Union? I mean, you, you talked about Tukhachevsky before as being, you know, his arrest as, as being an event that, that world opinion kind of rallied around and, and there was shock in the international community. But, but is there this kind of um, sense in the international community about, about the, the wider terror within the Red Army and how does that affect things like alliances and all of these other things that are going on at the time? I think it definitely um, affects international relations and potential alliances. It's one of those um, events which is pointed to um, kind of within the, the Great Terror itself, the wider Great Terror, as um, damaging efforts towards collective security um, in the in the ni- in, in the late 1930s before um, Stalin signs the Nazi Soviet Pact because um, it makes Stalin seem erratic, which of course you know that that's understandable. You know why would why would uh, you know Britain or France, the British government, for instance, um, make a deal with Stalin when he's just purged his military? You know, it, it makes it, it it seems like Stalin is not a reliable ally. Now, of course, that's not the only reason why um, efforts towards collective security break down. Um, there's, you know, the, the British government, for instance, was um, arguably more concerned about communism than it was fascism. Um, so that's a more complex story, but that it definitely um, makes things worse. Uh, and, and, and and the wider Great Terror does the same. And there are also um, kind of wider implications anyway, if you kind of push a story forward, when you look at the outbreak of the Second World War, Operation Barbarossa, when that is launched in the summer of 1941, there is undeniably a loss of expertise um, and from, from the military purge. And I think it's it's quite difficult to, to really say, you know, what is the real impact of that? Because we start to get into hypotheticals, you know, if Tukhachevsky hadn't been executed, you know, what would, would 1941 have gone better for the Soviet Union? Um, it's hard to say with any accuracy, but I think it, it, it's fair to um, argue that that loss of expertise still matters. Um, though, you know, again, this there's more complexity here too. Someone like Roger Reese, who's worked a lot on the Red Army, um, I remember that he's he's pointed out actually wider issues and weaknesses in something like professionalism in the Red Army, which go back um, a much longer time to its formation. Um, and this is for him the big reason why 1941 goes so badly in the Red Army's conduct and resistance and all the rest, rather than the outcome of the military purge. So that in, in itself is, is is a debate which is which is still ongoing. Um, but I think it's one that's difficult because we have to kind of speculate really. And, and therefore, I don't know if we're ever going to get satisfactory answers to that. As a final question, I just wanted to ask, when, when you stand back from all of this, Stalin's use of terror and particularly against the Red Army and try to look at it, with this broader view of, of what it says about Stalin and Stalinism, what, what are your conclusions about it? Um, I think that the military purge is quite telling of the nature of Stalinism um, because it is so dramatic. It's, it, it's um, something which puts Stalin's position at risk. And I think that's what the, the thing that's really interesting about it, that Stalin undermines his own position by decimating his armed forces in the way that he does. Um, and so what does it say about Stalinism as a whole? On the one hand, Stalin can achieve great things um, in the sense that you know, he industrializes the country uh, from the late 1920s. And it's that, that, that process of industrialization which is integral to um, the Soviet Union um, surviving and eventually pushing the um, Nazis and the German army out of, of the Soviet Union and, and winning the war on the Eastern Front. So the type of economic system which Stalin created is extremely critical to that. Um, and so Stalin can kind of move mountains in, 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 in achieving that type of thing. On the other hand, he seems to totally undermine himself by lashing out at conspiracies that don't really exist. And so it seems to me that when my kind of understanding of Stalinism, and I think one of my... my, my things I'm, I always kind of phrase it this way is that Stalin seems to be able to kind of build with one hand and destroy with the other that's very much what I think characterizes Stalinism so much um, he achieves so much by forcing through things like industrialization and then kind of shaping the country in the way that he wants but then things like the great terror the military purge do so much to undo that 
Um, and why do, how do we explain that? Well, I think you need to try and understand Stalin's worldview. He uh, industrializes the country because he st thinks war is coming. And, you know, war does come. Uh, why did he lash out at the Red Army? It's because he believes in foreign enemies and subversives. In many senses, this is, these, these are two sides of the same coin, and they derive from the very same enemy, which is, you know, capitalism, um, capitalist states, the war between communism and capitalism. But you can see how Stalin kind of acts differently um, within that kind of perceived threat and that he can, you know, undermine himself as easily as he can prepare the country for what he sees as an existential threat. Peter, we've been planning this conversation for quite a while now, so it's been actually really nice to to be able to set aside time and, and chat with you. So thanks again for, for taking the time to talk to us and um, I wish you all the best with all the work that you're doing. No problem. Thanks again for having me on. It's, it's been good to kind of talk about this stuff.